1 and 2 focus directly on the gospel of grace because as we introduce the book, uh, chapter 1 and verse 6, is, you ought to always keep that verse in mind, Paul marvels that they're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. So the Galatian churches, which are the first churches Paul in his first apostolic ministry went out and established, uh, that they were soon removed from grace. People came in, and as you understand chapter 1 and 2 there, you realize that someone was imposing circumcision on them, just like you read in the book of Acts, that uh, some went to Antioch and taught them that, uh, that they needed to be circumcised to be saved. And, and Paul didn't go along with that in Antioch, nor did he go along with that in Galatia, as Galatians chapters 1 and 2 deal with that issue. And, and along with that, when you bring in circumcision, you're also bringing in the law. So when you get to Galatians chapters 3 and 4, Paul begins to deal with the, the Galatians in the sense of chapter 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So, so once you get past the idea of salvation by grace, well then there is sanctification by grace, the Christian life by grace. And, and so he goes on in chapters 3, 4, even into 5, talking about uh, that, that the law doesn't make you spiritual, that you became spiritual because you received the Holy Spirit when you believed the gospel of grace. And, uh, and so the, now you have the Holy Spirit, and now the goal is to walk after, that, off after the Spirit. So anyhow, we were studying chapter 3, and after he, uh, you'll see what the review is in verses 1 through 9, as I bring verses 10 through 14 to a conclusion. You'll see it in verse 14. But let me read to you verse 10. We looked at verses 10 and uh, 11, and we want to make sure that, uh, that we get down to verse 14 today. So Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, he says, For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. By the way, that's, we covered that verse last time as well. Verse 13, it says, For Christ, uh, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, as it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, uh, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Um, so that in talking about uh, the law there, naturally he was excluding that everything's grace, and therefore he, he, he brings out the fact in verse 10, as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. The, the law was actually a contract between Israel and God concerning blessing and cursing. Trouble is, the law always led to cursing, not to blessing. Because <laughs> no one can continue in the law to keep those things. And, and so the law would lead to cursing. So he warns anybody who's now trying to impose law, works of the law with grace, that they're under a curse. Uh, because they're not going to continue in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. In verse 11, again, but that, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And... Even though Israel had the law, it's in the, in the prophets that God began to reveal that the just will live by faith. And that's Paul's message. That's what justification by faith is all about. Is that man is going to be found just before God, be declared just before God on the basis of faith. And we know that that faith, as it is now revealed, if you look back at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16... It says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now remember that faith of Jesus Christ is not faith in Jesus Christ. Faith of Jesus Christ is his faithfulness. He's the only one that lived, well he was born of a virgin, so he didn't have a sin nature. He lived perfectly, he never failed. He was tempted with sin, but never did sin. And even Pilate examined, I find no fault in him. And he was faithful to go to the cross and die. And he said, not my will, but thy will be done. And it was God's the Father's will that Jesus Christ go to the cross and die there for our sins. And so it's by the faith of Jesus Christ, his faithfulness, that we can be justified, not by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ. Even we believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. 
and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So, no flesh is justified by the works of the law. Verse 10 of chapter 3, if you try to be justified by the law, you're under the curse, because you're not going to keep the law. You're not going to continue in them. And that it was evident that that wasn't going to be the means by men going to be justified, because even Habakkuk said, the just shall live by faith. Verse 12 of chapter 3 says, And the law is not of faith. And that's real obvious. The law is due. <laughs> the law isn't just believe. The law is due. It says, The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. And that's an important part of that verse that we ended last time. And I'll just say this about that. that, that see the word but in verse 12? What, what we now know is that a man, how it is that a man is just by faith. But back when God was dealing with Israel under the law, they didn't have that information. So if they would just continue in the law, they were going to be blessed of God, and they would live based on the fact that they didn't get cut off from God. Under the law, there's all these warnings about being cut off from God. So if they would just continue in the law, even when they failed to do what the law said, there was always a sacrifice to bring, a, a day of atonement to attend. And so if they would continue in them, those, those Old Testament saints will live. But they're not going to live, they're not going to be justified on the basis of the law. But they lived under the law, and if they maintain that, they're going to continue to live. That's why he says, uh, the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Then he's going to go back to the fact that, that we all needed redeemed because we're all under the curse of the law. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. Now, before I leave verse 12 there, the man that doeth them shall live in them. That concept of how God was dealing with man under the law, that if they continued, that's Leviticus 18, by the way, was about verse 4, that says, they that do them shall live in it by them. That God continued, if, as long as they continued in the law, they wouldn't be cut off from God. We live in the age of grace where all have sinned and come short. Everybody today is cut off from God. But back under the law, they weren't cut off. They were only cut off if they did certain things. And, 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 and another, that concept that we taught last time, that I just tried to give you in brief, is important for later on in this chapter. If you look over in verse uh, 23, it says, But before faith came, see, today we're, we know we're justified by faith. But that's the message today. <laughs> so before that message came, how we can be justified by believing in the faith of Christ. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith that should afterwards be revealed. Well, that's not a negative statement in verse 23. We'll study that when we get there. But if you understand the last part of verse 12, you'll understand verse 23, that that law kept them. Kept them from what? from being cut off from God, from continuing in a relationship with God. And, and so the law had a purpose back then of keeping them and shutting them up. Now, shutting them up, sometimes you, you, meet some, you, know, like you tell a kid to shut up, that's kind of a bad thing or something. But shut up means if they were kept, it's like they were kept in prison, but kept from something. And that is from being cut off from God. And, and so it had a positive effect for them until faith came, and now when faith comes, now they come to Christ to get saved. But I want to point that out to you because I don't think a lot of people teach uh, the last part of verse 12 as uh, concerning what it means and, uh, and tie it in verse, verse 23. But we'll do that again when we get to verse 23. So you start out in verse 10 of chapter 3, as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. And then that statement, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So continuing with verse 13 then, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, as it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So re redemption is freedom by payment of a price. When we read that and studied it in Romans chapter 3 in our Sunday school class, we are talking about the debt of sin and that Redemption, Jesus Christ paid our debt of sin, and so we're free from the debt of sin. We're free from the penalty of sin. In this context, redemption is free from the curse of sin. Cursed is everyone that continueth not. Well, have you continued in all things which are written in the book of law to do them? No, so you're under the curse. But the good news is Christ hath redeemed us. He, his death was a, a freedom 
for us by payment of a price. He paid the price of our sin. He paid the price of our curse because he became a curse for us and redeemed us from the curse of the law that we're no longer condemned and cursed by the law. We're freed from that curse. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. And he tells us how he redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. I can't, uh, I can't go past a little statement in there that it's so small and some people say they get it and then you find out when you read their literature they don't just get it. And that is the words for us. Jesus Christ was our substitute. We're the ones cursed. He was faithful. But he became a curse for us. He, he was made a curse for us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. And, and so he became my replacement and paid my debt of sin and the curse uh, of, of not being able to keep the law. And that word for us is a statement of substitution. I just went through Paul's epistles and I was looking for just the phrase for us. Now the first one is actually uh, not exactly for us, but it's got the same idea. And I'm not going to take you through ten passages. If you just listen to me, I'll give you the reference if you want to jot it down. But in Romans chapter uh, 4, and the, the section of verses is verse 20 through 25, but in verse 25 there it says uh, that righteousness would be imputed to us who believe on the, uh, the, that Jesus, uh, our Lord, uh, believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now that's out of the ten, that one doesn't say actually for us. That actually says for our offenses. But you get this substitution there. That he was delivered, delivered up to die on the cross for our offenses. It wasn't for his. And then again, he was in the same verse, raised again for our justification. In, in uh, Romans chapter 5, in verses 6, all the way through 9, but in verse 6 it says, For when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And I always try to point out people that until they would take their place as an ungodly person, they can't get saved. Because Christ died for the ungodly. If you say you're not ungodly, then he didn't die for you. You've got to take your place as a sinner and recognize that when Jesus Christ died, it was for the ungodly. And so you need to line yourself up uh, with that. But that verse goes on to say, uh, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's that substitutionary payment. Um, in, uh, in Romans chapter 8, in verse 31, it says, uh, he, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up, for us all. So not only for us, but there he makes sure everybody is included in that, for us all. Jesus Christ died for us all. Um, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, Purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. And leaven sometimes is a type of sin. How do we become unleavened? How do we get sin out of our life? For even Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. <laughs> he died to pay for our sins. He was sacrificed for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, where the Gospels found, Paul says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. How that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So how can sinful man be reconciled to a holy God? Well, the next verse says, For he, that's God, made him, speaking about Jesus Christ, God made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? He didn't have sin for himself, but he was made sin for us. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In Galatians chapter 1, verses, that's just a couple chapters back, look at that. Go back to Galatians 1, might as well look at this one. In verse 3 it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So there he, he, he gave himself for our sins. 
And then with the passage we're studying is Galatians 3 uh, and verse 14 there. Or, or, whoops, make sure I get the right verse. Uh, 13. That Christ hath redeemed us from a curse of the law being made a curse for us. That's the seventh, or that's actually the eighth in the list that we're listing at. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, For Christ hath not appointed us to wrath, that's verse 9, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So he died for us. Uh, and then Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. <laughs> And uh, that would have been the tenth one on the list there. So those words for us and Galatians here, really in a strong language, when you think about cursed is everyone that doesn't continue in the law and that Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, that the idea of Jesus Christ being made a curse for us, he explains, look again at Galatians 3.13, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. When he says, it is written, the Apostle Paul is taking us back to Deuteronomy chapter 21. And that has a unique statement. You can see the emphasis about the fact that we have broken God's law and that we deserve to be cursed because of that, but that Christ hath, uh, became a curse for us. And he became a curse for us in the sense that it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now watch how that's used in Deuteronomy chapter 21. We pointed this out before, but... Uh, it impresses me every time I look at it. Deuteronomy, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Old Testament, chapter 21. I'm going to start in verse 18 so you can see the context of how that's written, what it's getting across. It says... Deuteronomy 21, verse 18, it says, If a man have a, stu uh, a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when thou hast chastened him, will not hearken unto them. Now you've got a deviant here that's going to cause problem in society. If he's not going to obey his mother and his father, uh, he's not going to obey the law. And, you know, capital punishment is God's remedy for those who... who uh, are a danger to society. Uh, now that certainly is the law to the nation of Israel, but I think we could learn something from it to, to have more of a safe uh, society by, by understanding that some people need to actually be executed. The best thing you could do, if someone's a murderer, and convicted murderer, they had an interview just recently about uh, a guy who was in jail, I don't know how many, 20, 30 years, found out he was innocent. So he was on death row for 30 years. Yeah, I remember that. And they were interviewing the, I think the state prosecutor. Boy, that guy was sharp. Because they were trying to like condemn the idea of ever putting anyone to death because of this one exception. Well, in the decency of society, you're going to make a mistake. That's going to happen. But do you let a bunch of murderers go free or feed and clothe and, and drain society of financial cost? Uh, because you might make one mistake out of a thousand or ten thousand. You know, that's just the cost of it. But anyhow, this is the nation of Israel. You get the idea here. There's this rebellious son. He won't, he won't even respond to discipline. What are they supposed to do? Verse 19. Then the father and his, and his mother, uh, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of, of his uh, place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. <laughs> Added more problems to this guy. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shall thou put away from among you, put, away, put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. You know, you put a guy on death row for 30 years, people aren't going to be afraid of death row, are they? <laughs> because, oh, i got 30 years, I might die of old age before they ever execute me. But if, uh, if a sentence was carried out speedily, people would be scared. 
Anyhow, verse 27 says, And if the man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be uh, to be uh, and he be to put be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that uh, the land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So the first thing there is you've got this rebellious son, and you bring him to the gate of the city, the men of the city stone him with stones. Then there's, it seems like a switch, but it's not really a switch. In verse 22, if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. Well, if they stoned him with stones, why would they hang him on a tree? Well, it's not to kill him, it's to make an example out of him. You, you not only kill him, but you put him on a tree as a display before everybody, and, and it says, uh, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. But look at the parentheses. For he that is hanged is accursed of God. And then goes back to that the land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. That you put him on that tree, he's a sample of someone who's accursed of God. You're going to put fear of the people and the fear of God in their eyes, that when you hang that person on the tree, that person on that tree is cursed of God. Well, Jesus Christ died on a tree, Calvary. And... and Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things in the book of the law to do them. But Christ has become a curse for us. Why? Because he, he was put on that cross. And on that cross, according to Deuteronomy 21-23, he's a curse of God. He, but he was the one who knew no sin. Who's the one that belonged cursed of God? He was a curse for us. We're the rebellious children. We're the ones that are disobedient to God. We're the ones who not only need to be put to death physically, but to die eternally separated from God as cursed from God on a tree. And Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, the one whom the Father was well pleased, goes and dies on a cross, is hung on a tree to become a curse for us. So when you read in Galatians that, you know, you're not just, it's the same, I mean, to die for our sins is to die so that we don't have to spend eternity separated from God. But you get a, a strong emphasis when you say, when you read that he became a curse for us. Then you realize what you, what you, you were actually ought to be the one cursed of God, eternally separated from God but that Jesus Christ took our place and died on the cross and died for us when he died on that cross. So, going back to Galatians 3 and verse 13. I'm going to read verse 13 again, but I'm going to go into verse 14. And notice in verse 14 it says that. So, what you're going to learn in verse 13 is going to... It, verse 13 happened for, so that verse 14 can become a reality. It, it's, so verse 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, as it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive, receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So that Jesus Christ became a curse for us, that two things could happen. The first is that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. And the second thing that he became a curse for us is that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, so Jesus Christ became a curse for us, and with that everyone, he's talking about Jesus Christ dying for all men, and that not just the nation of Israel, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Now I want you to see that I told you at the beginning. If you look back at Galatians chapter 3, look at through 6 through 9, because what is the blessing of Abraham? Well, that's, he's already dealt with that. It says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are, are the children of Abraham. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify, declare righteous, the heathen through faith, 
preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. What's the blessing of Abraham? Being declared righteous on the basis of faith. It's through Jesus Christ, through him becoming a curse for us, that we can be declared righteous before a holy God. Us Gentiles uh, in this age of grace. So that when you look at verse 14, that conclusion, that's what he has been explaining in verses 6 through 9. But then he says there's a second thing in verse 14. First of all, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. And then he starts with the word that. So now there's a second reason that Christ became a curse for us. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Well, look back at Galatians chapter 3. Look at 1 through 5. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath evidently been set forth, crucified among you? This only what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? <laughs> How did you get the Holy Spirit? By keeping the law and God gave you the Holy Spirit? <laughs> no, you believed on Jesus Christ and then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He that ministereth you the Spirit, worketh miracles among you, doth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? And when God was operating, doing the miraculous, those people didn't get the power of the Spirit by keeping the law. They, got, they believed and received the Holy Spirit. And then it was evident that they had the Holy Spirit by the works that they did. So that... The point in verses 1 through 5 is that you receive the Holy Spirit on the basis of faith. Well, Christ became a curse for us. What's the second reason? Verse 14, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So verse 14 is really a conclusion of everything that he said in the, in up, to the, up to verses 1 through 13 uh, in chapter 3. So that, that kind of separates where Paul's going to go to beginning in verse 15 of Galatians 3. So that what we are saying in, in Galatians, especially chapters 3 and 4, we're talking about being sanctified, first saved on the basis of faith, that's Galatians 1 and 2. Sanctified by the Holy Spirit is Galatians chapter 3 and 4. And the first thing that we saw in the first 14 verses of chapter 3 is that the Spirit of God is imparted and perfects by faith. Now beginning in verse 15, going to the end of the chapter, we're going to see that, that the Spirit and life freely given by God in Christ upon faith. So you're going to see the, 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 the tying in of the Holy Spirit and life, eternal life, is something that's freely given to us by God in Christ on the basis of faith. And the whole point of everything in Galatians is it's not by works of the law, it's not by circumcision, it's by faith that you get these things. It's on the basis of faith. So Galatians chapter 3 verse 15 says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be a man's covenant. Yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now he's setting up a, an example for us to, to see how it is that God is going to give us the Spirit and give us life unconditionally based uh, upon a promise. <laughs> Uh, the promise that's in Christ, a promise that's to Christ, and in Christ. So to set that up, he just speaks about natural covenants. You, can, you see that a covenant here is real close to the idea of a contract. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. So he's going to just talk about natural way that we would use the word covenant. It so, says, though it be a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. So, a covenant, you make a promise, a contract, that you're going to do something. And once it's confirmed, you know, it used to be you confirm it with a handshake, right? Now you've got 14 pages of fine print, legal wording, and then when you sign the contract and you have a fight, you go to court and find some one wrong term in all that legal, and the, and the judge throws the contract out and it's null and void. Uh, that's not the way it was ever supposed to be. <laughs> a contract was supposed to be as good as a man's word, and when you confirm it, handshake, in the Bible they had a different way of confirming it, we'll see. But once it's confirmed, once you make a contract, then you can't say, well, you need to throw this in, or don't do this part over here, or I'm not going to give you this much money, I'm going to give you less. You can't add to or take from once the contract is made. 
I always think of, I don't know why, building a garage. <laughs> Is you, you, know, you have a contractor come to your house and you sign a contract for X amount of money. He's going to build a certain size garage. You look at the design. That's okay. You agree. I'll pay that much for that garage. Well, he can't agree to give you a two-car garage and then say, well, I'm only going to build you a one-car garage. Or he can't, he's not going to build a garage and you're going to pay him for a one-car garage. No, you're going to pay what you said. You don't disannul or you don't add to. When you make a contract, that's the way it is. Now, that's, that's just a man making a contract, and that's how contracts are supposed to operate. So Paul brings that to our attention. Now, watch what he does with that. He says, now, to Abram, Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now that's God made some promises to Abraham. And he saith not unto seeds as of many, but, unto, uh, but, but as unto one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now we'll talk about that in a minute. It says, And this I say, that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now it helps you to know a little bit of time sequence of your Old Testament. Here some people are trying to add to us. The, the, God, the, the message, message through Paul is God is going to declare us righteous on faith. That Abraham is declared righteous on the basis of his faith. And, and now some people are saying, no, yeah, 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 faith is important, but you need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses also. Well, Paul's going back and says, wait a minute, if God said that he would declare Abraham righteous on the basis of faith, that's Genesis chapter 15. The, Abraham was born about 2,000 years into human history. As he points out here, 430 years later, Moses comes along and gives Israel the law. Now, can the law disannul what God said to Abraham 430 years before that? That, that it can make what God said to Abraham not true? That, no, it's not good enough just to believe Abraham. You've got to keep the law too. No, we'll find out later that the law was added, but it wasn't added to give life. God gives life freely as demonstrated in the fact that he declared Abraham righteous just on the basis of faith, not on the basis of works. So his illustration about that law is going back to the foolishness of the Galatians to take the message of salvation by grace and say, no, no, okay, that, that might be a start, but now i got to be circumcised and keep the law to be blessed of God or to be saved. No, you don't add to. Once God made the promise, you don't add to or take away. But the promise isn't just a promise that God made to Abraham. If you, if you go back to verse 16, as we said, even I said it in my prayer, I'm just amazed. Galatians 3 and 4 especially, even a little bit in chapter 5, that Paul uses some words, looks at Scripture in a way that only inspired by the Holy Spirit can you do that. Uh, you would never know what's going to be said in verse 16 unless Paul wrote it. And Paul didn't write it because he was super wise. He wrote it under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He, he points out, he says, Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. And he saith not, when, God, when, when we refer back to the scripture, we'll see this. And he saith not, and to seeds. Notice the S on the word seed. He says that when you look back there, God didn't say, and to thy seeds. He says, as, as, as many, but as of one, and to thy seed. And he says, which is Christ. That when God made the promise to Abraham, and to his seed, that seed is not just the multiplied seed of the nation of Israel. And I say just because you realize there is a multiplied seed of Israel that's going to carry out promises. But Paul looks back there and says, you know, every time he said the promises to Abraham and to his seed, who's the ultimate seed of Abraham? Christ. Jesus Christ. And so when God was making a promise of life to Abraham, being justified on the basis of faith, that wasn't just a promise to Abraham. That was a promise to the Lord Jesus Christ, according to what Paul said, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, you'd never see that in the Old Testament. Let me take you back there. Go back to Genesis chapter 13.
Now, there's only two places that I found where God actually said to Abraham and to thy seed, just to lock in that exact phrase. I don't believe either one is the phrase Paul's referring to, but I do want to point these out to you, um, because that's, you, you'll see where I think Paul's coming from. In fact, I should have told you to hold your place in Galatians, but in, in Genesis chapter 13, uh, God had just separated Abraham out in verse 12, in chapter 12, and, and he's going over some things in chapter 13, and he says in verse 14, Genesis 13, 14, And the Lord said unto Abram, now his name doesn't get changed to the full length Abraham until Genesis 17, but the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes, and look after the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. So, Lot is separated because this promise is to Abraham, it's not the Lot. It's about Abraham inheriting something. And this is a real, this is, well, this is the passage I think Paul's referring to, although there might be a different one I'll show you. But anyhow, the point is, is if you look north, south, east, and west, that's everywhere you can look, right? So where Abraham was, everywhere he could look, all the way around him, God said, look that, and then he says in verse 15, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Now the reason this one is important is you see the word to thy seed. That's what Paul seems to be quoting in Galatians. But the, the context here, like in verse 16 it says, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Well that's plural, isn't it? <laughs> So Abraham understands to thy seed to be a multiplied seed, and that's correct. Although Paul sees something even more in that. One of the things Paul sees more than in that is that in verse 15, when he's going to give him that land, he's going to give him that land for how long? Forever. So we're talking about an eternal inheritance. We're talking about eternal life. We're not just talking about Abraham inheriting a land, because, you know, when you die... <laughs> The, the, your, your heirs get your land. <laughs> it's no longer yours. For him to inherit that land forever means he's going to have everlasting life. So there is a promise of life that's to him, and that promise of life is also to that seed. And, and there is a multiplied seed, but Paul looks back here under inspiration of the Holy Spirit and sees more than just that. Now, we're going to come back to chapter 15, but just because there's one other place where Paul does that, look at chapter 17. He says in verse 7, he says, he says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee. Now, I'm only looking for to thy seed, by the way. There's a lot of places talk about thy seed. But it says, he's going to, between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in there. So that's plural, isn't it? <laughs> in their generations for an everlasting covenant. So there's that eternal life again to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Well, God is a God of the living. These people are going to have everlasting life in this land promised to Abraham. But in verse 8 he says, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Cain, for an everlasting possession. I will be, I will be their God. So you got the word to thy seed singular, but you have Abraham understanding that in the plural sense. But Paul goes back and sees a singular sense in, in that and points out that the ultimate seed that's going to come through Abraham, Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 1, is the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. So ultimately, that seed, that singular seed, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul's point is, is that when God made this promise to Abraham, it wasn't just to Abraham. It was also to his seed, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and he's coming out of chapter 15 in making that statement. Um, before I read chapter 15, you, go, you all holding on to Galatians? Yes. Okay, good. I let it go, so I've got to find it. But look again at Galatians. Before I read chapter 15, I want you to see something a little bit ahead of time here. Galatians chapter 3.
it says, after that statement in verse 16, where he points out that singular seed, look at verse 17. He says, and this I say, that the covenant, which was, catch the word, confirmed before of God in Christ. <laughs> There's two things. The promise, in verse 16, the promise is made to Christ, right? Now in verse 17, the promise was confirmed before of God in Christ. So the promise is to Christ and the promise is found in Christ. Uh, he said, and then he goes on to say the law that was 430 years after cannot disannul or add to. It's not, it, uh, or to make the promise of none effect. So, but I wanted to point out to you about the, 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 that covenant was confirmed before of God in Christ. Now when you talk about confirming a covenant, go back to chapter 15 of Genesis. And this is interesting because this is the chapter where when we were talking about Abraham being justified by faith, this is the chapter. This is where that statement is made. Uh, verse 5, before I, before I talk about that confirmation of the covenant. Verse 5 of Genesis 15 says, God took Abraham. Abraham's wondering, you know, okay, I'm supposed to have a seed. I don't have, I, I don't have a son yet. And, and God's saying, oh no, you're, you're going to have a child. He confirms it. He says it here. He's going to confirm it later. He says it in verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad, and he said, Look now toward the heaven, and tell the stars, which we talked about means number the stars, if thou art able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Tell the stars, count the stars, if you're able to number them. He says, So shall thy seed be. So Abraham's going to have a multiplied seed, right? It says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. When Abraham, when God looked at the heart of Abraham, it didn't even Abraham, Abraham didn't even say, Lord, I believe. <laughs> and God didn't say, Abraham, I'm now counting you righteous. He just said, I'm going to number your, if you can count those stars, that's how I'm going to multiply your seed, that, that number. And God looked at Abraham's heart because Abraham believed that and God counted him righteous just for believing that. So that's, that's free, isn't it? So he, he, he says that. Now, down in verse Verse 8, it says, uh, And he said unto the Lord, Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? I'm going to inherit this land. How do I know? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took, the, took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece, one against another, uh, both the birds, uh, but the birds divided he not. And then when you start reading verse 11, God's going to, you know, Abraham's keeping the fowls from eating the dead animals there. And then God makes a promise to Abraham about what's going to take place until he brings his people out of Egypt. But go down to verse 17. As all that was going by, it says, And it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. And behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between the pieces. The same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river Euphrates. Now notice that phrase, that there's this, there's this bur uh, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that pass between the pieces. What's happening here, Abraham wants to know, how do I know I'm going to inherit this land? Well, first of all, God said so. That would have been enough. But God didn't just leave that as enough. To take those animals, to divide them, and then for a person to walk between them, that's how a covenant was confirmed back in Abraham's day. And what God is doing, you read it in the book of, of, of Hebrews, as God made an oath with Abraham. He not only promised, he swore to it. Well, that's what's going on here, is he's confirming the covenant made with Abraham. That's why verse 18 says, the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Well, he made, it Abraham. He made that covenant back in chapter 12. But here he's confirming it the way that covenants were confirmed. That's why Paul started out saying, if a man make a covenant, you can't do an all or add to. And now God made a covenant to Abraham, a promise to Abraham that he's going to inherit this land. That's the Lord passing through this covenant. But remember, look at the condition of Abraham. Abraham's asleep. And it came to pass that the sun went down, and it was dark, and behold, a smoking furnace 
No, I missed the first part about Abraham sleeping, didn't I? Where's that at? <laughs> Way up there. Okay. I should have kept reading about the fowls. Verse 11 says, And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he, and he said, now God's making some promises to Abraham. And after he makes those promises, God alone passes through that. Now, if two people are making a covenant, and this is going to be important later in Galatians 3. If two people are making a covenant, like I make a covenant with me and, and Leon, I would pass through the covenant or through the sacrifice and declare what I'm going to do. Leon would pass through the, through the same pieces and he would declare what he's going to do. But who's the only one that passed through the pieces? God. Abraham didn't make any promise to God here. God made all the promises. So the covenant was made to Abraham as a promise of God to Abraham that depends on God keeping his word, not Abraham doing anything. That's what salvation is all about. Jesus Christ paid it all. All we do is believe and receive eternal life. We don't do any work for eternal life. But the promise was made to Abraham this way. That, this, I, I read that because of that phrase in Galatians uh, 3.17, confirmed of God in Christ. But I want, <laughs> no, I want to, but I can't. I can't believe it. It was just, it was just right on the 12 a few moments ago. <laughs> what we need to look at, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll do both. Go to, go to Titus. Well, I'll, I'll make it clearer next week. Go to Titus chapter 1. You've got to get those details together in order to make the point. The point is, is that the Apostle Paul is saying that when God made this promise to Abraham, that Abraham would be declared righteous on the basis of faith, that he would inherit eternal life on the basis of faith, that he would have an eternal inheritance just because he believed God, that that promise wasn't just to Abraham, that promise was also made to Christ, and you wouldn't have known that except by a revelation given to the Apostle Paul. You see it, you'll see it in other places, but in Titus chapter 3, a chap, no, Titus chapter 1, it says in verse 1, Paul, the servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth was at, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in, these due, in, in due time manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of the everlasting God. In due time, Paul was given a revelation concerning the promise of eternal life that God made before the world began. Who would God make a promise to before the world began? Can't be Abraham, right? It can't even be Adam. God made a promise about eternal life to someone before the world began. And what that is, is in the eternal Godhead. Before man was ever created, before man ever sinned, God had a remedy for sin. In the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you'll see they had a meeting. And God the Father promised His Son, I'll give eternal life as a free gift to all who believe on you. I'll declare Him righteous on the basis of faith. That promise wasn't just given to Abraham. It was also given to His seed, which is Christ. And it was given to Christ before the world began that if He would come into the world and die on the cross and pay for man's sins, God would give eternal life to all who believe. And, and that's... You can't change that covenant. Abraham... The illustration is 430 years later, you can't add the law. But how about, can you go all the way back before when God made the promise to his son and say, well, if they keep the law, then I'll give them eternal life. No, the promise to his son is eternal life as a free gift to all who believe. And Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the will of the Father in, in dying for our sins. And that, so the promise wasn't just to Abraham, it was made before Abraham, it was made to Christ. And... 
And you would know that except by the revelation given to Paul that came in due time. We'll pick up on that next week. But at least I got that out. <laughs> Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the book of Galatians because so many people are so mixed up on the gospel that they always want to add their works, their effort, their faithfulness, and none of that can save. In fact, if they'd compare it with the law, they'd realize they're under the curse because even if they've done a lot of things right, they've done things wrong. Father, we are thankful that your Son became a curse for us, that we might receive the promise of eternal life through faith in him because of his faithfulness of dying in our place and paying for our sins, and because of your promise to him that you would declare us righteous on the basis of faith. We thank you for that promise, Lord, and the fact that now we can be saved and understand that we're saved and know we're saved because we believe the truth that's been revealed in your word. Thank you for our study today. Bring us back again next week to, to glean these deeper truths. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.